think the next phase of our conservative movement is to move on from just running from something. And we need to start running to something. We've identified the poison, whatever it is, wokeness, gender ideology, climatism, covidism, globalism. That poison exists. It's going to fill a void, though, and it, it traces a vacuum. It fills a vacuum that actually lives in our hearts because it's created by the absence of real purpose and meaning. And I think if we want to be a true conservative movement in this country, around the world, in the United States of America, we're going to have to fill that void with the things that used to fill that void. That's how you actually stop the poison from entering. Let's not just be against, though I think we've done that plenty, race, gender, sexuality, and the climate. What are we actually for? What do we stand for that fills that vacuum of purpose? Let's talk about the individual. The fact that there's only going to be one you, your you, regardless of the color of your skin, you're endowed with your own free will and commitment to achieve whatever you want to in the world. Let's talk about the family, that you are a child of two parents, a mother and a father. All of us are. And that's the best unit of governance known to mankind. Let's talk about the nation. The idea of not being some nebulous global citizen, but a citizen of this nation, in my case, the United States of America. And that we won't apologize for it and that we do believe, yes, we are a nation under God, individual, family, nation, God. These are the things that satisfy our hunger for purpose and meaning. And yet today's conservative movement has all but abandoned an actual affirmative vision of our own. That's what I'm running to revive in our country. But one of the things I've found over the years is that sometimes you can see things clearer if you're looking from the outside in than if you're just looking at yourself from the inside out. And I actually like to do the same in return. One of the countries I have been carefully paying some attention to, I would say even studying over the last few years, is what's happened in Hungary, what Viktor Orban has done as the leader of Hungary. I traveled there a long time ago. It's a different nation today than when I first went there for the better. And I think a lot of that is because of Orban's leadership. And you know, I think that there's a lot we can learn outside of the partisan struggles of the current moment, Republicans versus Democrats. We can get wrapped up in, a, in an echo chamber in a bubble of our own. Sometimes we have a refreshed perspective by actually looking abroad and then bringing those lessons back in. And equally good to talk to someone who's from one of those countries who's looking at the United States and describes what he sees. So that's what we're going to do today. And that's why I'm pleased to welcome to today's podcast, Balash Orban who works in Viktor Orban's administration. I believe he's the political director for Viktor Orban. He's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the lessons from Hungary and the experience in Hungary, pro-family policy, what that means, what it means to actually stand up to the managerial class and bureaucracy within a government, maybe an extension of a broader globalist agenda and how Hungary has managed to stand up to that in a way that we could actually do well to learn from here in the United States. And so with that, Balash, I want to welcome you to the podcast, and I've been looking forward to this conversation. I'm glad you're finally here. Hello. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, Vivek. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you very much for having me at your show. So tell me a bit about what you think Viktor Orban has done successfully in Hungary that we could stand to learn from here as a conservative movement in the United States. I'd love to hear from you on it. Viktor Orban and his um, right-wing conservative par party won the elections uh, first in 2010, and since then we are in power. So right now we have 13 years of uh, experience. And I think it could be that, that this, is, this is the most important reason why the world looks uh, on Hungary. It, it's because we just we were just not talking about important values on the conservative side. We were not just talking about what should be done, but we actually did it. And we introduced these conservative um, uh, values. We put these conservative values into everyday governmental practice. And it turned out that this is a kind of a very unique experience experiment on, on on the Western world and it's actually it turned out that this is this is working and and the country can be successful based on 
conservative right-wing Christian democratic values, the, the values you also mentioned, like family, uh, nation, and God, these values that could turn into practice and it will bring prosperity for the country. So so it's, it's, it's actually the opposite is happening what is um, said by the liberals that these conservative values will bring down the countries. The opposite is the true. If the follow if you follow these values, if you are able to turn them into everyday governmental practice, then then you are going to be successful economically, culturally, politically, and not the political party, but but the country as as such. And so, so give me some examples of when you talk about reviving, let's say family. I know that's been a big part of the pro-family policy agenda. W what are some of the things you did to make that happen? It is, and it's connected to the, to the problem of, uh, of, of mass illegal migration. So all the Western countries are in demographic uh, decline. And according to all the public opinion polls, mothers and, and fathers, uh, boys and girls, uh, young, young parents, they actually want to have more children than at the end they they will have so so they 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 want to have more children we don't have to convince them we don't have to force them to have more children we just have to help them to reach their goals and the problem is right now that that the, the liberal state is uh, in favor of supporting mass mainly illegal migration instead of putting all the resources into family support programs. So we did the reverse. We, we, we introduced the border fence. Uh, we stopped actually illegal migration on our borders. And we said that we don't want to spend our money to the very costly integrational programs, which are not always uh, successful, but we want to give these money to the families to those who want to raise more uh, children. And financially, through government programs and through the complete environment, should be help them. And we change this environment and it works. We spend almost 6% of our um, GDP um, to family support programs. It's three times more than the military expenditure. Military expenditure is also important, but family. So 6% of GDP is going to what you would call pro-family expenditure. Yes. Which indeed. whereas normally you have 2% of GDP on military. Yes, indeed. Obviously, we want to increase the military spending as well. We need to do that. But, but, uh, but I think if you want to take it seriously, you have to change your budget and spend at least five, six percent of your GDP um, to to support the families. And we we started many programs. Like what kinds of things? Again, let's get actually we'd love those specifics. Yeah. So first, if you you don't have to pay any personal income tax for mo mothers, they don't have to pay personal income tax if they have four children for their entire life. And we want to introduce that for mothers with three children. Wow. So, so, so if you're a mom with three kids, you don't pay income taxes in Hungary. If you are a mom with four kids, you don't have to pay personal income tax. And we try to expand it in the future. It's going to happen in the future. We try to expand it to mothers with three children. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a good one. That's one example. Another example is that um, it, you get, um, if you are a young couple, you get married. Uh, and you need extra financial support to start your life, to buy a car, to buy a, buy a house or do whatever you want. And you make prom promise that you will have one, two or three children. You get this extra starting financial support uh, from the government. Like um, we are talking about around 30,000 US dollars. So you get 30,000 US dollars if you are a young married couple and you have in 10 years time three children. And then you can spend it to, to buy a house, to buy a car, as I said. So it's, it's up to you. So it's sort of like a universal basic income, but for only if you have children. Exactly. And only if you're married. Married, yeah. 
You have to be married and you have to have uh, uh, children. Now, what if, now, now presumably, if someone's, if someone's already wealthy, then you don't have to, yeah. Sure. And it's working. The, the fertility rate went up from 1.2% to 1.6%. Um, so I think it has proved that uh, this kind of- That's a very, big jump. 1.3% to 1.6%? Yes. But we need to have more, actually. We, right now, we have a kind of a strategic thinking on, on how to increase it further because you need to have 2.1%. Uh, percent without immigration to have a su sustainable population to sustain the death rate without immigration true yeah L let me ask you this is um have you thought of i mean i'm sure you did but do you think that that kind of income creates a disincentive for people to work in the country Oh, actually, we are building a workfare society, so people have to work. So you need to have a job to get these uh, uh, these uh, subsidies. So it's not a social aid program. It's like uh, it's like Got you it. have to have a job. So a young married couple with children. How many children? Three. Have, a young married couple with at least three children. Yeah. Gets aid, but only if one of the parents is working. Yes. And obviously, it's just one. Uh, it's just one measure. We have m many more. Like, uh, like if you are working and you have a proper job, you have you get tax cuts also. Um, so if you have children, so if you have children, you pay you pay less, mm. and you're working. So everything, all the family support programs are not based on social. Um, issues, but based on the fact that you have the willingness to have a job, to get married, and to raise children. Yes. Well, that's pretty fascinating, actually, uh, because it still borrows from a, a liberal instinct. Well, not necessarily a liberal instinct, but, but policies that could sound like a liberal policy of government providing aid. But to tie that to families that are procreating, contributing to the repopulation rate, and also actually working. Yes, Vivek, in this regard, Hungary is a bit different than the United States. And Anglo-Saxon conservatism is a bit different than the Hungarian conservatism. So obviously, we conservatives, we are not in favor of a big state, for sure, that uh, this is a liberal agenda. But, um, but, but we do think that conservatives should use the state to promote conservative uh, uh, values and support those who are um, ready to, to live a normal life with children, get married, get job, and so on and so on. So in, and in Hungary, this question is not so controversial. And the government has, like, not only through programs, but, but also through PR activities, uh, com campaigns, the, the, the resource to create an environment where where uh, where people think that the normal way of life is not to jump into the vogue agenda but 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 to get married to have children to go to work and to live a, a decent and normal life and 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 without changing any kind of regulation in connection with abortion for example uh, because of this initiative the number of abortions halved in the last 10 years number of marriages doubled number of divorces halved and as i mentioned the num the fertility rate went up the fertility rate, yeah exactly so yeah, it's kind of simple when you say it that way right i mean that it becomes a normal way of life to get married to have kids and to have a job like that is that is the norm for how the society lives. I think it's everywhere. It's everywhere. This is the norm. I think that the way it lands on an American ear, Balash, the way you put it in saying it's different in Hungary versus the US, I don't think it has to be so different in Hungary versus the US, actually. I think that the thing that people fear is when you talk about conservatives should use the state to promote conservative values. I, I don't disagree with that instinct. I would just, this is an American context, would frame it differently because. The thing that people then think is, 
fascism, totalitarianism that we will at behest of, you know, military or, or sort of, uh, you know, police intervention foist this onto you. And then people recoil and they fight back against the very things we want to promote, marriage, having kids and work versus what you're talking about is just using really economic incentives to get people to choose the kinds of things that they would be better off choosing for themselves anyway, which is, I think, a very different proposition. Yeah, I agree with you. And and it's uh, it's the basic pillar of this, th uh, of this thing that, that you have to maintain freedom, freedom of mm -hmm. choice. They can have the life. They can have the life they want. That's why I started at the beginning with the, uh, with with talking about the public opinion polls. That that you know, like we don't have to convince the people to have this kind of life. And there are some people who want to have another type of life. It's it's totally okay. It's no problem. The state should guarantee their freedom to to live their life what they want. But the, but the problem is that. In the Western societies, at least this is the case in Hungary, the majority of the people, they want to live this life with the job, mm -hmm. with the marriage, with the, with the family. And, and I think the state cannot be neutral or cannot be hostile because, because right now, if I look around in many Western societies, if you want to have this kind of life, the state itself is hostile towards you. So mm -hmm. it's it's not supportive. I'm not talking about being supportive, but it's also not neutral. It's hostile because it's 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 a saying that all the social programs, all the social social benefits, all the subsidies, all the positive discrimination elements in the system should go to that direction, which is not supportive for those who are who are belonging to the majority, but but belonging rather to the minority. Minority rights are important. Freedom is important. Without that, there is no flourishing society. But uh, but you also have to be economically supportive, as you said, uh, to those who want to go to another pattern. And they are right now left behind by the political elite, by the liberal political elite. I think there's an interesting point you made here about the pro-life movement in the U.S. as well is this is how you get more women to yes in having the child or even fewer being put in the position to have to face the choice of having an abortion. You don't, you don't have that if you're in the, in the family context, two parents with a level of even if you brought an extra kid in. So well, I have two kids, how can I handle three kids? Well, great. We're promoting that because we have a population level birth rate issue. And I think this is different than, say, the Chinese model of, you know, they went the other direction with the one child policy and mandate it. We're not mandating anything, is your point in Hungary. You're saying that we will affirmatively promote the kind of society that we think will allow us to flourish, but while giving individuals and co equal citizens still a chance to live on their own. So I guess, I guess if I was to give you, three buckets using your own language. One is one that is, as you put, hostile to pro-family, pro-nuclear family, pro-work, pro pro-childbirth pro environment. And that's hostile because it's giving money to everybody who doesn't do that without actually promoting those who are actually living in a family structure. One that is neutral, one that just says the government's done subsidizing anything and let people arrive at the choice that most, most of them want to arrive at. And then one that affirmatively steers people in that direction using the power of the purse to do it. Sounds like you're in the you'd you'd favor the third of those. True, true. I okay. I would describe the first one as a current progressive model. I would describe the second one, the classical liberal model, which which did exist, which which was the case in beginning of mid. 20th century, but it's not anymore there because the state is occupied by the progressive. So right now there is only the first model, and uh, and 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 I would, I would call for for the alternative model, which is the third, as you described. This is, this is if you like this phrase, the conservative uh, way of thinking. And then even within that, though, this is crucial, though, even within that conservative model, there's a choice 
between how you achieve it, right? Is yes. One yes. is what the yes. other, what the progressives will naturally label you to be, which is fascist and forcing this onto people. And the other is one that says, no, we actually embrace an element of the classical liberal model of choice, but we're not, not, we're not neutral in the choice that we would like for you to make. We're rooting for you to make the right choice, but it is still your choice to make. That, I think, is the beauty of the final step of the act, which avoids, you know, which avoids some of the accusations that you'll otherwise face. True, and and I think this is why the abortion issue is a it's a very hard issue. It's a very hard topic, and but this is why it's a it's a good example. Like uh, like in Hungary, we didn't change any kind of regulation in the last thirteen years. We have actually quite a liberal uh, abortion policy, so you can choose freely uh, whether you want to uh, have the baby or not. But the government while it's maintaining the freedom of decision making gives you all the necessary financial and other kind of uh, supports which are needed um if you want to make a decision to keep keep the baby and 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 the reason is i i think the result is very obvious more and more women without changing any kind of regulation which is without causing any kind of social conflict in connection with that very hard topic or having a decision to keep the baby and more and more children are born. You know, you make me want to, uh, when did, when did Victor first take over again? It was 2010? 2010. Yeah. So you make me want to draw, I'm drawing it literally in my notebook as we speak, a table with three different columns. What the first column is Hungary pre 2010. Second is Hungary post 2010, and the third column is the U.S. today. And then I want to draw across the bottom. One is actually let's just start with abortion rate. It'd be kind of interesting to sort of think about that. Abortions per birth. Let's just sort of maybe make make that the metric, right? Abortions per birth. Then we'll have um, birth rate. Or what would you call net repopulation rate? Yeah, death yeah, rate yeah. minus birth, you yeah. know, death fertility rate, minus rate, but fertility, you know, net fertility rate, and then uh, and then one is actually GDP as a percentage, or or sort of expenditure as percentage of GDP on what you'd call pro-family policies in the U.S. That'd be basically zero right now, uh, but both for military and for pro-family, um, it would be an interesting. An interesting comparison. If you're open to it, I'm gonna have my team get on this. But if you can help us fill out the Hungary side of this, I would be very happy to do so. I would be very happy to do so. So, so maybe we'll wrap with this. Balash is is what's been your um, observation of what this has done for the character of national pride in Hungary? It seems to me it's gone up quite a bit. But do you think it's the family foundation? and the work culture that's doing it? Or are you guys independently focused on fostering Hungarian national pride in other ways? And which do you think is responsible for the resurgence of national pride you're seeing in the country? Well, I, I, it's a very complicated question. I think that it's a, it's, it's a complex issue. So, but w definitely there is one um, basic pillar of it and it's, it's, it's obviously economy. So economically, you have to be successful. And you have to be able to to build up a workforce society. So in in Hungary, we we created one million extra jobs since two thousand ten. So and you know it's quite a significant number because the country's population is ten million. So it's like imagine that in the United States in ten years time you have thirty five. 35 million more jobs. So it's quite a significant change in the society. And we have flat tax. So it's a completely renewed uh, uh, taxation system, which is encouraging you to, to work more and then you earn more. This is the, this is the idea behind it. So the economic um, part of the story is definitely very successful. But there is another part of the story, which is more more about um, emotion. The history of Hungary is 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 um, 
I, I think it's a beautiful history, but it wasn't easy always. We have been occupied by, by foreigners many times in the last 1,000 years by, by the Mongols and, and then by the Ottomans and then uh, by the Germans, uh, by the Habsburgs and then by the Nazis and then by the Russians. So it's like we just regained our independence uh, um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and there was, there was quite a long transition period but right now we have our sovereignty. We are able to make our own decisions in foreign policy and in domestic policy. Uh, we are proud, getting more and more proud of our cultural heritage, of our institutional pillars like the church, the family, the nation itself, and so on and so on. We are strengthening them. We are making people being proud of their history and culture and, and being more optimistic about the about the future of the country and it's uh, it's an emotional issue and the two things has to go i think in hand in hand if one pillar is missing then the whole architecture is not um effective yeah but i uh i know there's this expression in you know often in the christian tradition of to experience the love of god you must experience the love of your family first i, I think that there is um uh, Something to be said about an analog for the nation. In order to be proud of your nation, you must have the pride of your family first as well. And uh, I think you're more proud of a nation when you're also part of a family that you're proud to be part of and that a family that is proud of you for being part of it. And it opens your heart to national pride as well, I think. I agree with you. Very similar emotion, very similar kind of emotion. Balash, this is a great conversation. Learned a lot in a short amount of time. Uh, I'm going to ask our teams to be in touch to sort of draw this, fill out some of these data points, if that's something you're receptive to. And I know that's something we on the American side can learn from. Uh, I can't promise the same in return, but but hopefully it'll be useful to you. Oh, but still, your country is uh, wonderful. I love your country so much. And it's still, you know, we are very happy that that you are interested and American conservatives are interested in in, in Hungary. But it's, but it's actually still a mouse and an elephant discussion where we are the small mouse and you well, are the, the big elephant. The, Sometimes we like we can our be elephant helpful. and the mouse to be friends, actually. Yes, we, we, indeed. The friendship of the elephant and the mouse. And let's, uh, That's an old let's, story. Learn, let's continue to learn from each other and, and make ourselves better. I think Thank you I think very much, Riva. Yeah, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Goodbye. I'm Vivek Ramaswamy, candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Vivek 2024.